I sit in peace and silence. I allow my body to relax. And very gently, I go within, within my awareness. Within my own inner world. For a moment, I allow the external world to be. And I just concentrate on my own inner sacred world. It is as if there was inside of me a secret garden And gently, I open the door. And enter that private, intimate, inner space. Thought after thought, I go deeper within myself. And become aware of all the potential that is there. sacredness of my inner being reminds me of a cathedral or a grove in nature. And I sit in this pure space majesty the light and 
my heart. It feels content. I am in my inner sacredness. the stillness of the moment. I feel comfortable being within myself. Within this inner dimension, within my inner world, I am totally protected. The silence is an ever renewed experience. The present continues forever. I am at ease being myself. Opening up to this inner world of tremendous potentials.
within this inner silent dimension. The quantity, the density, the unlimitedness. is tangible. the light within Always be there in my sacred, secret inner garden. And every time I choose to, I can go back within and sit with myself. in the cocoon of my inner world. Good evening, Om Shanti. Welcome to L'Emergence and a special activity, a special event this evening. We have a very special guest who will be joining us to share insights, experiences, experiences, <laughs> and more experiences. Um, we have the pleasure of welcoming Sister Valerian from Switzerland who is coordinator of the Brahma Kumari Center there, but as well as a host of other things. But what I found find so um, special, and uh, which I think you'll very much enjoy, is her heart, that she'll be sharing her heart with all of you this evening, with all of us this evening. And this 
pull or this very deep interest in the exploration of what creates quality relationships with the self, with each other, with nature, the elements, and the role of spirituality in that, which ultimately is what we practice and teach at all the Brahma Kumari centers, is how to heal and how to make whole the way we interact with each other, starting with the self. And um, I've really enjoyed, in the time that she's been here, to have her experience and her unique perception and perspective on this. So I think you'll very much enjoy the topic this evening, which is, let me see if I can remember here, the call of time. And so inner resilience and the power to adapt, and of course the role of spirituality in that. And so it was with great pleasure that I welcome Valerian, 35 plus years practicing, teaching, sharing Raj Yoga meditation, and here with us this evening to share from her heart, her beautiful heart. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Om Shanti. Hello. So, my pleasure to be here with you this evening. Um, this is um, a, an interesting topic, um, very related to the work um, that uh, we are doing spiritually, because I think that. Um, Eventually, spirituality is the only source of resilience that there is. Um, so, do you know what the word resilience actually means, where it comes from? Probably means no. <laughs> <laughs> so, the word resilience is very much um, like the word stress, a word that comes from industry. Stress being the quantity of pressure that metal can stand before it breaks. So they measure the stress, they invented that word for that purpose. And the resilience is, is what actually is the resilience of the metal. How much is it going to be able to resist is its resilience. So the stress, the pressure, the resilience, the capacity to not break. So I always find it very interesting that in today's world, human beings are compared to pieces of metal <laughs> because really when you look at uh, the depth of the human soul there is really so much about it <coughs> and um, so how much are we able to stand so first in in the spiritual language we usually use the, the word tolerate which is very different than the word to stand. When you stand something, you're not tolerating it, you're just um, trying not to break. Whilst tolerance is a bit like the kind of resilience that I would like to talk about tonight, <coughs> is the capacity to actually bring out from within me, the feelings, the power, the virtues, the attitude, the outlook that makes me feel like being tolerant is the thing I want to do. When you stand, you actually would rather not be standing anything. You'd rather things stop happening. So I find interesting the whole concept of resilience and um, 
I have a few questions that I uh, put on paper for you uh, so that we all look within and we see what it looks like <coughs> for each one of us. Do you want to do that or do you just want to hear me talk? You're happy to work a little bit? Okay. So pieces of paper are difficult to see with my good eyes, so I kind of sent myself an email. <laughs> so I would like you to look at your, at your life and um, look at the challenges that you've been, <coughs> yet you've been facing. And um, remember a challenge. Can you remember a challenge that you've had to face in your life? You can choose medium size challenge, mammoth type challenge or mouse type challenge. It's your choice. Remember the challenge? Yeah? Okay, so then what did you feel when this particular challenge appeared in your life? What were your first <coughs> feelings? You can tell me, yes, of course. Not again. <laughs> Not again. Yeah, that's a good one. What else? Fear. Huh? Fear. Yeah, definitely. Disappointment. Disappointment. What else? Doubt. Doubts. Very good. Powerless. Huh? Powerless. 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 Very true. Okay. So, the feelings aren't great, right? You're not enjoying the challenge. Do we agree? So then what did you do? Do you remember this? Huh? You analyzed, I analyzed. You analyzed it. You? Hope. You developed hope. Okay. What about you? What did you do? Yeah? Move forward. You move forward. What about you, Christine? Um, hmm. How did you do? I think I, I, I was, uh, I, I rebelled. You rebelled, yeah. yeah. Very often we rebel. What about Lynn? I would talk to myself. You talked yourself into something. Yeah, that's often what we do. What about you? What did you do? when you face the challenge. Hmm? You, yeah? Observe it first. You first observed it, okay. So you tried to measure and stand back. Yeah, very good. So that's what we all have different, I think we all went through all that, yeah? The rebellion, I think it's something very common when you're facing a challenge and then you know it's not going to go away. <laughs> so you try to inject yourself with hope and you try to make yourself talk yourself into being brave, right? And also you start thinking, okay, I have to look at that. What is this? How am I going to work on it, right? And then eventually when the challenge has passed, when you've, you've kind of went through whatever you had to go through, what's important is to also notice what did you learn so you remember that particular challenge you looked at, right? Mm -hmm. So what did you learn through that? Did you learn something? Mm -hmm. Capacity, huh? of doing. capacity of doing. You learned that you had the capacity of facing. Okay. Mm -hmm. Hey? Experience. You had experiences. You gained experiences, yeah? What else? What about you? 
you realize you have strength. What about you? What did you learn from this challenge? Hmm. Energize myself. To what? Energize. Energize yourself. Great. Anything else? What did you do experience? You learn that you can trust yourself. Okay, very good. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. You learned that you needed to increase capa compassion. Very often we learn that we have to increase capacity also. Mm -hmm. Right? There is kind of a positive learning and also a realization, right? Mm -hmm. I need to be more like that or less like that or um, whatever, whatever. So then if you look at all that, I'd like you to tell me within this process of facing this challenge, what was your strength? Right? You faced something, you went through it, you came out of it, analyzing now that everything's gone. <laughs> what was your strength? That you trusted yourself? How about you? Huh? The source, the source, Baba. That Baba God helped you? Yeah? To connect. You learned to connect. to connect. So that was your strength, that you could connect to the source. Okay. What about Lynn? Courage. You, your strength to go through was the courage. What about you, Tag? What was your strength? Confidence. That you had confidence? That was your strength that pulled you through it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Christine? Mm, I learned that there was a lot of benef more benefit in mm -hmm. that test than what I thought. Mm -hmm. So your strengths was that you understood that there was benefit. Yeah, I let go of the resistance. Okay. Patience. Patience. Okay. That was your strength that pulled you through. Virtue. Sorry? Virtue. Your virtue. Let go of the virtue that I, the power that I had within me. Uh-huh. Throughout, okay. So you learned that the virtue pulled you, right? Yeah. Which is very much <clears throat> what I can hear from everyone. So it's very interesting to look at resilience because um, there is um, a, a very famous um, uh, a person who's been a a analyzing the ecosystems, the resilience of ecosystems. And I found that very interesting because if, if you look at <coughs> anything that has to uh, go and have resilience, there is a story in resilience. There is a story in strength. And um, what I see is that <coughs> if I'm aware of my strength from the beginning, then this strength is going to pull me through. But if I'm aware more of my fear, like we all said in the beginning, there is a moment when you face challenges where basically you're rejecting these things, right, that are happening to you. And what is it that allowed you 
to be strong? Is it that you had to let go of this negativity, of this fear, and maintain the power? So that's a very interesting process because if you look at resilience in, in everyday life, there are people who are facing floods, people lose their houses, people lose their health, people lose their spouse, people lose their and uh, children even. And um, some aren't able to lose that. Some can't survive. And some do survive. So it's very important to be able to see what is it that we have to be able to let go of and what is it that will give us that strength to let go of. And there is the story of, um, of yogic farming. Do you know what yogic farming is? Yogic farming is an experience that we've had um, within the Brahma Kumaris. Um, there are some people who are farmers in India. As you know, there was a time where there was a lot of suicides amongst the farmers in India. I don't know if you remember that time. Do you remember, I don't know if you knew the story. I don't know how much I have to say. Or You're aware of some of that? Or shall I better tell the story a little bit full? Yeah? Huh? Okay. So, as you know, India is, uh, it, there is a population in India that uh, might be wealthy, but the farmers in India aren't very wealthy. They, they're quite poor. And uh, what happened is that um, the enterprises like, um, to not name it, like Monsanto came in India and they brought um, to the country uh, their famous seeds. And they brought it as like the new innovation in technology and farming and agriculture. And uh, um, India signed many of the contracts that many of the countries signed. I think it's the case with Canada, it's the case with France, it's the case with many places in the world. So it means that the countries basically accepted that the people had to buy these seeds only. So if you go to the market of seeds, if you're a farmer, the only seeds you can buy to farm are these modified seeds. And modified seeds are not fertile, meaning they are fertile that they will bring you um, they, they'll bring, you know, wheat, if it's wheat, they'll bring corn, if it's corn. But you cannot usually keep the seeds and seed them again. So usually also these modified seeds are seeds that you need to have fertilizers and not the kind of fertilizers that they had before, which was made with cow dung or which was made with, uh, you know, compost, but it's a kind of um, fertilizer that's chemical. So the chemical fertilizer allow these unfertile seeds to grow. Uh, and if you don't put the fertilizer, it doesn't grow very well and also after you've put this kind of fertilizer for a few years the earth becomes barren becomes poor and in order to buy all these things the farmers were rather simple people they 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 had to to put their land on, on stake to get all these things. And what happens is that for an Indian farmer to give his land away is like depriving his child from his inheritance. 
So they, many of them committed suicide because it was in their name that these things were done. So by killing themselves, their child was still owners of the land. And also they were totally desperate. So um, in these circumstances, when this happens a lot in India, which, by the way, also happened in France. You never had farmers suiciding before, but you do have farmers suiciding now. What happened is that um, they, the Brahma Kumaris in India, it's a very big organization. And one of the work that they do there is uh, go into the villages. As I said, villages are very poor. Very often the villages are actually indigenous people that don't even speak Hindi, the, the, the language of, the, of the, 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 the political language of India. In India you have um, like uh, 28 languages with about 12 or 15 different alphabets. And then you have over hundreds of local dialects. So the Brahma Kumaris go into the villages to help people practice de-addiction because addiction is really a big thing nowadays. So we have the addiction here, alcohol, tobacco, cannabis and all sorts of drugs. The same happens in India and when people are facing such unhappiness they also are facing uh, this addiction problem. So what happened is that um, the people who learned the art of becoming free from their addiction uh, decided that maybe they could also do that the power to transform their inner being was something that was so strong in them that some of these farmers, along with um, others in other places of India, started to try and transform their seeds because they didn't want to buy this stuff. Their land was a wreck. So they started meditating on the seeds, on the land, on the new process. And in that way, they develop what is now known as yogic farming. And in that way, um, they created harvests that, was tot that were totally different. So when they came back to the university showing what they were doing and the results they were having, um, it was amazing. And they also started, therefore, uh, working locally with their own Brahma Kumari centers and working uh, so that there would be more people meditating on the fields, more people meditating on the seeds, more people within the whole process practicing this. And also they found some universities that were studying agriculture that were interested to look into that. And they, they, they became aware that there is more nutrients. The seeds become different. So some of these seeds were actually modified by the meditation and were able to grow and reproduce themselves. And there were more, more um, there were also the vegetables tasted better, looked nicer. And so this was also a very interesting thing because, as you know, if you're a, uh, an adolescent, you know, a teenager, and your your mom's meditating and your dad's meditating, it's kind of boring, right? But when they start earning money, more money than the neighbor, you know, the youth became interested. So it's really actually brought also within the communities, within the families, a very amazing... Um, change in the dynamics and um, I went to visit some of these farms of course India is really huge so forget about meeting all these people but I went into like maybe five farms and into two universities 
<coughs> because I also work with <coughs> environment and climate change, so I was very interested. Because just as a parenthesis, one of the things that happens with these modified seeds is that they don't know how to adapt to climate change. Whilst the natural organic seeds, natural seeds, original seeds do. <coughs> so when I went to visit these people, um, the one thing that I was very aware of was the pride they had of their work. You know, they loved their land. And when you give yoga to your your fields, you actually give love to your fields. And you actually give love to your own self doing the job that you do. And that was something so beautiful for me to watch, the enthusiasm these farmers had, the pride they had in their work, in their land, and the comparison also between, you know, maybe they had a small, you know, not because they aren't wealthy. It's not like American farming, which is miles and miles and miles. It's really family farming where you have it's quite uh, visibly different um, slots of earth near the other, one near the other, and the farmers, the neighbors were there. And what was interesting was that um, many of the neighbors started thinking, okay, I want to do that too. But meditating is not something you can do just for greed because you want the money. In order to actually put this energy and the soil and the seeds, you actually need to, to develop this kind of connection with the source, this love for your land and this awareness of your own inner power. So this is, I find, a very beautiful story of resilience, which was um, amazing for me to, to witness. And um, what I wanted to say with this history of, of uh, this story is, is how when you, um, when you are just about to lose everything, you know how to let go of what you don't need. And in the cycle that I was telling you about regarding ecosystems, if you look at the seasons, right? What happens within the seasons? What happens in spring? Things start to grow, right? What happens in summer? Things start to flourish. What happens in autumn? I mean, the beginning of autumn, you start harvesting, right? And what happens in winter? Everything dies. So resilience for me also, inside, outside, spiritually, in relationships, is also understanding the different phases that we are actually living through. Because if you try to pretend you're in spring when it's winter time, <laughs> you are gonna be knocked off, especially with this kind of weather, right? So it won't work, it won't work. And I think that today people are made to believe that resilience is constant spring, you know, that, you know, youth is the dawn thing and, and, um, and there is no acceptance of, of the different phases of life. There is a moment for each thing. And you don't define yourself by what happens to you when you are resilient. When you're resilient, you actually have the inner power to be uh, free inside because you happen to learn nakedness, no support, no need, no nothing, and then you're free. You're free to go through death. You're free to go through loss. 
because you you become aware of your own capacity to be zero and i find that very interesting because what hurts in challenges is that we don't want to let go we don't want to give up we don't want to change we don't want change we want the same <laughs> we want this spring this lovely sun we want this we want that and usually what happens in life is that we need to be aware physically that wanting is actually the enemy of being and when you go through being through accepting that okay things are what they are and i can experience the wealth within this nakedness and then i can start wanting wanting to explore wanting to understand but it's not a want things it's not want respect it's not want the sun it's not want wealth it's not want this physical eternal use that everywhere we see as a, as a, especially for the women it's an amazing thing that happens the only perfect women is about 17 you know and uh, is basically a, a model on a, on a magazine and the real women of 17 hate themselves but they make them up to be the one thing that everybody else wants to be. It's totally ridiculous. But what happens is that we are going through a process of everything becoming the image. And behind the image, it's as if there was a nakedness and a desolation. When you accept to go beyond the image within yourself, you can find the wealth, you can find the power, and you can find the great capacities that you have to adapt, to encounter, to let go, and all these things that you were um, talking about earlier. And within these ecosystems, if you look at the plants naturally, when you put uh, a seed, or if you look at a pregnant woman, it is amazing the quantity of vitamins, of minerals, of nutrients that the body creates, because it's in a phase where it has to give all this away. Just like the seed, if you put a seed and it starts seeding, it starts growing, it starts germinating, it's amazing the process of multiplication and then it has to go through a process of accumulation in order to become a tree in order to give fruits that these energies in the tree need to accumulate just like people need to accumulate to give to their children need to produce to produce families but at a certain time these things, like the famous forests in Australia, you know, they need to burn so that the seeds can come out, which is amazing when you think about it. So likewise, I find that going through these phases in our mind, we don't need to die physically. I'm not asking you to die, but I'm just asking you to contemplate the inner eternal being that is beyond death. And when you manage to center yourself in this inner spark of reality, of light, of power, nothing can happen to you. You're totally safe. So for me, resilience is very much this. <clears throat> and then if you know that, 
you find a way to adapt, just like most of you were saying earlier on when you were talking about when you faced your challenges. You were actually facing by pulling, being pulled through the hope and the strength and the courage that you had. So it's almost like these things are the natural way to adapt to circumstances. The virtues and the inner powers will definitely allow you to find the way to recreate yourself. You might not think about yourself as someone courageous. Like I have friends that I find tremendously courageous. You know how they face their health issues in such amazing tranquility. And usually when I tell them they're courageous, they look at me and they say, Valerian, I don't have the choice. I don't have a choice about it. <laughs> and uh, of course they would have a choice, but they don't even see that they have the choice to just break and cry and <laughs> be totally unpleasant. <laughs> about it. No, they don't have that choice. They don't see that choice. You see, choosing the power to adapt to things with elegance, with pride, with power, with love, with greatness, with peace, with patience, all these things then come when you are able to connect within with your inner reality, with the source of your inner power. Because <clears throat> very often when we are facing all these negative things that are happening, when we are in the rejection, when we are in the fear, when we are in the um, powerlessness that you were talking about before, what happens is that emotionally it creates within us <coughs> a vacuum, uh, um, a kind of, it consumes our strength. And it's something very important to realize. Negative emotions have the tendency to eat you up. Your mind then doesn't work. Your strength isn't there. So the, the whole attitude within, it's important to give yourself, like you were saying, analyzing. You said, talk to myself. So it's like the capacity to remind yourself about the things that are good for you, that are not good for you, and tell yourself, okay, if I go on thinking that way, I'm going to burn myself. I don't want to be burnt more than I am already. So you can give yourself the kind of um, care that you need to go on. You can give yourself the love that you need. Instead of just being the victim of the emotions that you're feeling, because very often that's what we do to ourselves. <coughs> we become the inner victims of what we create because we believe it. It's a very interesting process of witnessing what's happening in such a way that we can uh, go through. Si tu prends le micro, ça aide rassurant. So like this, I don't have to repeat everything you say. Thanks for the reminder. <laughs> I was just thinking that the challenge itself that you are facing can be a mirror of something, a past experience that you have gone through mm -hmm. and that you were not able to, and that you carried without... Um, without being able to free yourself from the burden of that experience and that challenge can just show you mm -hmm. look this is this is what you've gone through yourself and mm -hmm. uh, just see it and be free stop carrying mm -hmm. it from 
you know, a long distant past. That's very true. That's what fear is. Fear is me projecting the experience of a past trauma and applying it to the present in my imagination. And um, it's really amazing to do that to yourself, <laughs> right? Because we do it to ourselves. It's not something that anybody else does to me. So it's so important to realize what we're doing. And what happens is that emotions are so quick, then we lose our capacity to be resilient. We lose our capacity to adapt. So I need to be aware of what I'm sensing. But I need to analyze what I'm sensing and I need to analyze what I want to be able to change. So it's like being very, very awake, very awake. And um, it's not pushing things away, putting them under the carpet, because it doesn't work. But it's looking and speak to yourself, say, no, no. I mean, I, I was... Um, once I was going to work, I used to work at night. I used to work with juvenile delinquents in Paris. And um, so I was going to work. It was very late. And um, I had to drop something somewhere or see someone. So I went through a very dark corner of Paris. Not a very good idea, not a good place. But I'm kind of not scared sometimes not a good idea not to be scared and so somebody attacked me jumped on my back pulled a razor blade and say give me your back and I remember in my stupidity I just laughed and I said so what do you want me to do now you want me to fall I mean I, ca I was carrying the guy on my back and so I said okay I'm gonna fall and you take my bag bye and he left and I wasn't aware of what would happen with the situation because, as I said, just being scared isn't a very strong part. I mean, that kind of fear, at least, isn't really part of me. But now, sometimes when I walk at night in a place I don't know and I hear someone running behind me, I know I have to stop and look back because otherwise I can recreate something in my head that I don't want to recreate. So it's very interesting. You know yourself. You know what you have to do. You need to stop the imagination. Most of the fears that you have are not going to materialize. You're just torturing yourself. So that's also a very important thing to, to understand. I don't know if you have any other comments or questions or thing you want to say. Yeah? I think Lynn was the one raising her hand. Yeah, I didn't see anyone Just else. Just a, a small thing. Um, when you say that often when people are uh, suffering, they have uh, an illness or uh, something, their health is not good, and uh, they will say, I have no choice, you know, say, well, the, you have a lot of courage, or uh, uh, I, I find you, I find it extraordinary how you are with all that, and they say, well, I have no choice. My mother was like that. But uh, so the, there's a difference between uh, like saying or thinking, I have no choice. It's like a way of uh, for them to um, to adapt, I mm -hmm. guess. That, that's what I understand. But uh, what's the difference between saying, I have no choice, and uh, saying uh, or having the uh, being able to accept? Well, what I see is that some people say they have no choice and do accept gracefully and do um, manage to still find pleasure, dignity, and beauty in life. 
some people don't stop complaining and crying and and uh, are really unpleasant and so you see the the it's not saying i ha what i was wanting to share through that is that sometimes actually very often the most courageous people aren't aware that they're courageous they just are courageous and it's so much part of their nature that they don't even see themselves as being courageous it's like i don't have a choice it's like what i have to do yeah. And that's what I like about virtues and, and inner strengths. It's, 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 it's almost like it naturally comes, like beauty, you know? You can't say, oh, thank you for being beautiful, you know? It's like, this person is beautiful. And, then, and it's, it's, so not having a choice in a sense, it's almost like a destiny. There is this destiny of being able to face things, of being able to, 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 to to be bright or to be generous. The generosity of some people is just like that too. And they don't feel that they're being generous because they feel that they're just being themselves. That's what I meant with this. Mm -hmm. And um, but we can also cultivate these things. You see, they, they, they do happen in us. Some of them are natural. So some people are generous, but they're not necessarily fearless. I mean, there is always <laughs> space to work. There is always, um, all, I find that all virtues or qualities and, and strengths are cousins and brothers and sisters and friends. They usually help each other, you know, but sometimes it's interesting to see that if I was more generous, you can tell yourself, okay, if I was more generous, things would be easier. You know, you can see something that you could be more of and that would actually bring uh, better results in your life. So having this vision of what it is that could bring more beauty, it's there, it's there within you. It's not that you have to invent it or ask for God to send you a telegram. No, 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 it's there. But, you know, what is it that I can do? Anything else? Do you know the story of the colibri and, and the burning forest? No? Have you seen the colibri? A hummingbird, right? They're really tiny. They're really tiny. They, I, I mean, they're beautiful. I lived in a tropical country for many years, and um, I just had so much joy when I was seeing them because they're one of the birds that fly staying still, you know? Mm -hmm. They use their wings just to stay still, and they love nectar. So they go into the heart of a flower and they drink. And that's their food. That's their food. And they're tiny. They're tiny. Some are like that. And um, so once there was a, a forest that started to burn. And all the animals in the forest started running. They ran and they ran and they ran and they ran. And Suddenly, someone saw that there was this little hummingbird who was collecting one drop of water in the river and flying back into the fire and dropping it. And everybody around them would say, Are you crazy or what? Have you seen your size? Have you seen, have you seen the fire? And the hummingbird said, Well, I have to do what I can do. And the story goes that um, an angel saw that and he sent some clouds to rain on the, because he was so touched by this little hummingbird. So I really love this story because you know there's not always angels to stop the flyers, but you, you understand that, you know, everybody died maybe, but did that 
hummingbird die a happy bird, basically. You know, how do you feel about yourself? Uh, how do you feel about bringing what, what you can instead of just uh, being the victim of an incident and, 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 uh, and just... Or comparing what the others bring or don't bring. And yeah, or being angry with everybody else, not doing what their job could be. <laughs> yeah, true, definitely. And um, I find that really it's, um, you know, there is in the, in the practice that we have regarding meditation, it's a little bit like that also. There is so much capacity within us to bring kind of vibrations that the world needs in silence. You know, the capacity of peace, the, this power of love, the power of lightness, of respect, of greatness. These things, they don't cost, but their value is immense. So the immensity of the value of what we can bring is really something that we can all discover in silence. And this resilience then that you will gain from learning how to let go and find what the value, the deeper value really is. Because it's a sense of interesting, right? Letting go is very often unpleasant for people. But it's the only way to discover your real strength. Okay. Wait. I was just going to say, uh, I find that uh, to be able to let go like that and uh, to accept, you have to... Uh, Oh, you you have to, or you become very humble. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, yeah I and we I admire. No, usually, we admire humble people. Humility, mm -hmm. we like it's a quality that, um, yeah, we uh, find Thank interesting. Yeah. Shall we have a moment of silence and meditation to finish? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> so very gently, again, I go within. I allow my body to relax. I allow the tensions to dissolve. And I open myself to my inner world. The security of my inner being, the cocoon. my sacred space, a silent, pure and beautiful space. Where I feel the gentleness of the light. And the presence of love, the freedom of my thoughts are like wings taking me up and within and a world of silence. where beauty and majesty the 
silence and greatness. shine within me. And this inner space of the present Capacities are endless. And whenever I want, I can become. What I am at heart, a pure spirit of light. I take the form of a star. and sense stillness and silence like warm blankets of love embracing me Whenever I want, I can go back within and open up to this inner reality. 